you know, I, <laughs> I, I definitely want to thank our interpreters, Anne and Jennifer. Uh, that is uh, something I wanted to mention right off the top. You know, I'm sure this isn't going to be easy and a lot of us speak really quickly, so. <laughs> okay, we can begin then. Thank you, Baruch. Okay, great. Well, um, welcome, 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 everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Queer Ancestors Art Opening. Of course, normally we would be having a huge art opening event for these incredible artists, but the world is what it is. We just hope that, you know, you're safe, you're out there washing your hands, wearing your masks, and ready for a great event. Now, before I go on, I want to acknowledge that today, although we are meeting virtually, Strut is hosting this meeting in Yalamu, the indigenous name of San Francisco, and on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Ramatush speaking Ohlone people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Strut and myself would like to pay our respects to the Ramatush Ohlone elders past, present and future. Um, what else? Uh, I would also like to welcome everyone on behalf of Strut. What Strut? It's this building behind me uh, that is in the Castro. I'm not at Strut right now. This is just an illusion. Uh, I am the community events manager there and I run our, our art programs. And it has been an honor to do this collaboration with the Queer Ancestors Project. I think this is like two years, three years that we've been doing this. And it is probably my, one of my most favorite parts of my job. Um, and, uh, and what's my job is I create events that are engaging, uh, connected to the arts and help me tell people about what we do. Strut is a part of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. The foundation has been around since 1981, but we at Strut, the sexual health clinic have been around since 2003. We do all sorts of sexual health services from HIV tests, SDI tests. We help people get PrEP, Truvada, PEP. We help folks with, uh, if, they, if there are trans folks that need uh, sexual health navigation, uh, having to do with trans issues. We also have services like that at Strut, as well as a program called Trans Life that uh, does all sorts of stuff for queer folks that are trans and uh, trans folks that aren't queer. You don't have to be queer to receive those services. We also have several other types of programs that help with harm reduction. We have programs for women. Uh, uh, traditionally, Magnet, the clinic that is in the second floor of Strut, was a sexual health clinic for men who have sex with men. Not anymore. Since we opened in the Castro, we are a clinic for everyone. So you don't have to be a cisgendered gay man to come and use our services. We invite all of you to come and use our services, whether you are non-binary, gender queer, a woman, trans, we have the times, the slots, and the services to help you with your sexual health navigation. Um, and more, to find out more about everything we do, please visit us at sfaf.org. That's our website, sfaf.org. Easy to remember, stands for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And I will be sharing it in the chat throughout the event. One more thing I want to mention before we uh, keep, uh, start up the, the real event with the stars, we are doing a survey. I went to pick monkey and I figured it out. I've done it before, but you know, I think my brain because of the pandemic just keeps forgetting things, but I created a survey that's gonna help both us at Strut and the Queer Ancestors Project get to know you better. So if you are coming to our events and enjoying our events, we'd love for you to fill out the survey. We're gonna share it in the chat closer to the end of the, today's event, but uh, please fill it out. It helps us uh, with everything, getting to know who's coming to our events, who they are, what they're liking, what they're not liking. We just wanna know more about you. So uh, please fill out that uh, survey when we put it in the chat. Let's see. Um, I want to also just introduce real quick, we'll mention that my coworker Esteban is here and I'm so happy they're here helping me with this event because I am so bad at technology. And that's why I love that Esteban is like 10 years younger than me and they are really good at technology. So, you know, that's what, that's what us older queers do. We just ask the youth for help. So <laughs> thank you for being here, Esteban. If you if all have questions throughout the event, feel free to ask me or Esteban and we'll do what we can to answer them. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm just going to ask everyone to please take a deep breath with me, let it out, get ready to see some incredible art. I'm going to shut up now and pass it over 
to the great Katie Gell Martin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful host. Um, you really have 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 been a, the hostess with the mostess uh, at every turn. And I want to thank everyone who's joining us tonight um, so much uh, so that we can warm ourselves around the fire of one another. And we really need to do that, especially right now, to remind ourselves that we exist within communities and that we're held by one another. And when we tug on that web of connection, it shimmers. And I know that that web of our interconnection is shimmering, is shimmering tonight. I wanna send some special love out to the um, QAP artists from two years ago who gathered together on Zoom from around the world to, um, to have dinner together and then to join the show. So lots of love to you all. And also I wanna send some special love to my parents who are celebrating their 61st wedding anniversary tonight and are joining us as well. So yay, thanks Kazi for clapping. Um, I really wanna thank our incredible allies, Baruch and Strutt, um, for being such amazing supports and really um, making a home in the Castro for everyone. I want to thank SOMARTS, uh, the South of Market Cultural Center, which is where um, we usually meet uh, when we're able to meet physically together. I want to really thank the Queer Cultural Center, um, which is just, uh, they do such amazing work. If you are a artist, writer, performer of any kind in the Bay Area, you want to know about the Queer Cultural Center. And the best thing is they also want to know about you. So be sure to check out QCC. And a shout out to Esteban, to our uh, interpreters, Anna and Jennifer, and also to Celeste Chan, I know who's here. And Celeste Chan teaches the QAP writing workshop that's underway right now, and we'll have a reading in April. So you can check our uh, website, our Queer Ancestors Project website, or follow us on Facebook or Insta to be sure you hear about that. And I'd also like to thank um, the San Francisco Arts Commission and the California Arts Council and many individual donors, very generous individual donors who have made this whole, who make this whole program possible. Um, but most of all, I wanna thank the artists whose work we're celebrating tonight. Creation is always an act of faith. Wrestling something new from the universe requires faith and it requires courage. And all of that has been especially challenging this past shattering year with the grief, the trauma, and the isolation that we've been experiencing. And every one of the artists um, gathered here demonstrated such incredible tenacity. And I'm so incredibly proud of them. And they also demonstrated hope because you cannot create without hope. And all of them have the discipline to sustain hope. So, so thank you. Thank you. You've been so wonderful to work with. And I always feel like I'm the luckiest person that I have a front row seat at the act of your, your creation. So the Queer Ancestors Project offers free workshops in printmaking and writing for queer and trans people age eight to 26. And most years, this program, we gather at the print studio at SoMarts. But this year, the artists gathered on Zoom and printed on their bedroom floors, at their kitchen tables, at their desks, in their basements, in their laundry rooms, in their backyards. I don't think I've missed anything. I think I've gotten most. Most year, we print, we print on an etching press that weighs about 500 pounds and looks like this. Baruch is gonna show us a picture of this is the, the steel machine that weighs 500 pounds. It cost as much as my first car. And this is what we normally print our prints on. But this year, um, because we could not gather together, the artist printed instead with this. Here it comes, wait for it. That's right, a wooden spoon. So every one of the prints that you're going to see here tonight has been rubbed over the back with a wooden spoon. And I see one of our former QAP artists, Sen, thanks for checking in, uh, Queen Sen Sen, saying, yes, the best tool. In fact, 
The wooden spoon, the lowly wooden spoon has a long and an honored tradition in the history of printmaking. Um, but I will also say it's a lot more work. So every print that you'll see the artists individually rubbed over the back of it to transfer the ink from the plate that they carved to the paper. Thank you, Baruch. You can, you can take our lovely image away. Thank you. Um, so what that means is that some of the prints this year are a little less saturated than most, and they may be a little dappled. And what you may find as a result is that you need to gaze at them a little bit before they give up their secrets. I find this kind of gazing a little bit like when I'm looking up at a starry night sky at the constellation and I have to gaze a little before the figure emerges. So bear that in mind as you admire the prints tonight. Every one of them was hand rubbed um, by the artist. And in addition to their prints, the artists wrote artist statements for each of their pieces. And I think of these statements as kind of the artist getting a chance to take you by the hand and invite you into their images and into the journey they made in creating them. And their words describe really remarkable stories of connecting to indigenous ancestors, kink ancestors, um, of, of connecting with ancestors that were basically their former selves, their younger selves. Um, and also of traveling a bit with ancestors to develop myths or symbols to express their experiences. When I look at the prints created in the Queer Ancestors Project, I see two acts of creation. One is of course creating the image, imagining it, drawing it, carving it, printing it. The other act of creation is the reach the way that each individual artist reaches toward their ancestors, finds ancestors whose lives resonate with their own and then connects with them each in their own way. So every print that you'll see is a record of that reach, of that connection that was forged. And I always like to reflect on that reach as I'm admiring the art. So now I'd like to invite you all, everyone gathered here, to invite in your queer and trans ancestors, to hold them for a moment in your mind and in your heart. The ancestors that you invite in may include someone that you lost this past year that you're still, that you're grieving. It may be, uh, a queer or trans ancestor that you've learned about, read about, heard about, or it may be an imagined ancestor. Because of the ways that power and privilege work, only some of our queer and trans ancestors have been able to leave a record of their experience. And yet we know that we have always been. Ancestors may not have used the words queer or trans or gender non-binary, they may have manifested in their own ways, in the context of their own times and cultures. But because we know they existed, we can study, we can learn as much as we can, and then we can imagine them. We can call up the ancestors that we need to share their wisdom with us, to lift us up. And I also believe that ancestors, these ancestors that we imagine, that they need us as well. They need us to imagine them, to kind of literally remember them. They need us to hold them precious and to carry on their lineage in our own way as their beloved descendants. Just as we may want to do someday because we are all, of course, we're all hurtling towards ancestorhood. So I invite you now to take a moment, invite in your ancestors. And now I'd like to welcome the artists. So what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna invite each artist to introduce themselves and tell us about one of the prints that they have in the show. And um, this is gonna be a little bit of a house of cards as um, uh, we do the technological shuffle of bringing them forward and also bringing their artwork forward. So first I would like to invite in bags who is going to talk about her print, Untitled, Open Jaws. 
So bags, how wonderful it happened. You're here with us. So I invite Hello. you to introduce yourself <laughs> and tell us about your print. Yes, my name is Bax. Um, this, this is my print. And I am just going to read my artist statement um, before I guess I say anything. Um, but yes. Ever surrounded by forces seen and unseen, presences that pull me deep into myself, like being underwater in cycles in jaws that hold me tight. When I reach out, ancestors, living in past, reach back, showing me that breath is life in the jaws of death. But it's hard to grasp, to breathe, when the cycle spins me back into the depths. Faded energy and strength makes itself known in the ink, buffed by wooden spoon onto paper, Yet my breath is growing. I feel so close. When someday I'll grab a hold and the marks and the ink will be pulled. Yeah, that's my artist statement. Um, yeah, this piece is untitled um, because I still don't know what I am focusing on in this. Uh, like there's like a lot going on, I guess. Um, and it's really just, and just working on this really gave me a lot of time to reflect because it takes me a long time to do things. Um, and especially like the physical act of carving and then, um, you know, like, well, even like the, the whole process is very long and it's, it's physical too, which is something that like is, like takes extra effort for me as well. Um, so in the whole process of doing this, like it, it gives, I'm just there sitting by myself thinking. Um, and so it's really like made me recognize um, a lot of like, just like a lot of different things, like cycles in my life um, that have really been revealed to me by learning about my ancestors. Um, and it's just like, I guess like with this print, like it makes me wonder like what it takes to break out of cycles that have continued ever like for generations. Um, so yeah, that's basically what my print is about. Yeah. Thank you, Bags. Thank you very much, so much for talking about your print. And now I'd like to invite up Cairo Mo, who's going to talk about their print to air Shan. Hello, um, I'm Cairo. I'm mostly a painter, but it was really meaningful to work in block printing for this. So this is my print to Urshan. And when I was making it, I was thinking about how ways I could communicate with my queer ancestors. Like how can I thank them for the life that I'm leading today? And so doing research into my own lineage um, Chinese folk religion is really based on ancestor worship. And my last name is Mo, which means witch. Um, so my queer ancestors were shamans, the practitioners of ritual and religion. And, you know, they come in contact with the holy. And in Chinese folklore, there's this concept called Ling, which is sort of like the holy. And Ling is found in the unexplainable, the confusing, like albino animals, um, amphibious creatures, roosters crowing at the crack of dawn, like confusing natural phenomena. And where Ling is in the substance between yin and yang, between um, like masculine and feminine, that's also where I see my queerness and trans living. And so for my queer ancestors and me, like queerness is holiness. And in this place where Ling resides, where my queerness and transness is, is also where I wanted to imagine a temple or build a temple for my queer ancestors. Like where would they have worshiped at? Where would they have been worshiped? Um, but I can't go to this temple because it doesn't exist. Um, so the process of me carving the incense burning, um, invoking the two rabbits, for the rabbit god, um, the Chinese god of gay love. <laughs> and, you know, that's my way of continuing their rituals. And it's my offering to them is 
this like process. Um, I'm not going to read my artist statement because it's super long, but if you go into the exhibition, you should read it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. Thank you. And uh, in our chat, we're getting lots of call outs on queerness is holiness. So thank you for that, for that beautiful um, this. Yes. Thank you, Cairo. So now I'm going to invite up Cielo Flores. Um, and they are going to talk about their print, La Diosa Tona. So I'm hoping, uh, yes, yeah, Cielo is on their way. Yay. Hello, folks. Yay. Um, I don't know why the video is not working. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. Oh, it is magic. Thank you. Thank you, Baru. Thank you, whoever made that magic happen. Welcome, Cielo. It's so good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Cool. So yeah, my name is Cielo. Um, I use he and they pronouns. Um, and my story and ancestors, right, it starts in El Salvador, um, where my, my ancestors and my parents are from. Um, and we live here in, in Oakland, um, or Olone land as well, right? Um, and I'm an artist, um, a gardener, and a soon-to-be herbalist in training. Um, and so my work, definitely, I try to focus on honoring our plants as ancestors. Um, and with that, I kind of wanted to also reconnect with my own indigenous roots um, and also like figure out how I could honor the physical and spiritual land where my ancestors are, you know? Um, I feel sometimes like there's a, a huge disconnect um, because I'm so far away. Um, and so I feel like my, my queerness and it's definitely like a man, my, my work was definitely a, a physical and a visual manifestation of what I've been going through in my own like gender journey. Um, and so definitely this is La Diosa Tona, right? She was inspired by a trans woman who lived in my mom's village. Um, and I also write more in my, in my artist statement, but I, I just wanted to share just kind of a little bit more naturally what, what inspired her. Um, she was definitely like a reimagining or an imagining of who my two-spirit elder would be or like auntie could be or would be, right? Uh, so her message, uh, her message is really to undo gender, um, to cut what, you know, basically severs us from what, from, from Mother Earth and what actually um, can harm us in that same way, right? What, what do we need to release and let go of to, to really um, heal and nurture those around us, right? And so in that undoing of gender is where I see we can heal ourselves um, and go back to really the practices of our elders, um, of nurturing both the Mother Earth and like our feminine and both masculine energies. Um, and so, yeah, I, ha I pay homage there. She has some seeds in her hands. She has a blade, right, to symbolize the releasing um, or the cutting of that what doesn't serve us. Um, and I also wanted to pay homage um, to, you know, my, my, my ancestors, right, I don't have in a, like a legit concrete, um, you know, tribe that per se, like that is where my my folks have been severed, right? My connection with my ancestors has been severed um, through genocide, right? And the civil war uh, that happened as well. And so I wanted to really just go back. And I looked at a lot of um, both Mayan and um, Aztec like art and the codices. Um, and that's kind of what I tried to draw inspiration with the symbols. Um, and so I, that's kind of where I have her speech bubbles, which are also like a manifestate like of spell casting, of speech, of, um, yeah, manifestation. And so that's where I symbolize, like, let's undo gender um, and let's go back to what nurtures us. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Cielo. Thank you, thank you. Powerful, powerful. Yes. All right, so thank you so much. So now I'm going to invite up Dylan Keo Kennedy, who's going to talk about their print, Untitled, The Kiss. Yay, Dylan, you're here, and here comes your, your incredible print. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dylan. I go by they, them pronouns, um, and I'm going to be talking about this print. It's untitled. Both of mine are untitled because I'm not into labels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was gonna, I'm gonna expand a little bit on my artist statement for this print. The idea came from 
um, attending a Zoom webinar like this one hosted by the Japanese American National Museum. They were having an event about reaching back. It was literally, it was very aligned with the Queer Ancestors Project. So, so I decided to go and it was um, about reaching back into history and trying to reconnect with queer elders in the Japanese American community. Um, so most of the people talking were people from my mom's generation in their 50s and 60s talking about trying to find elders for them. So people from my grandmother's generation. Um, and a lot of the event was about actually how it was very difficult. <laughs> um, there weren't a lot of old, older out queer Japanese American people for them to talk to. Um, and most of those people are from, um, or were growing up, were young in, in the, the era of World War II which is, has a very specific history for Japanese Americans. So I'll go in a little bit of the context there if you're not familiar. The 1940s during World War II, Japanese Americans were incarcerated en masse, citizens, non-citizens, because they were considered basically a public threat. They were, there was a risk after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of public hysteria about Japanese people in the United States and how they were going to defect and all this. Um, so they imprisoned them. <laughs> um, in the meantime, there are also Japanese American people who, as that is developing, joined the United States military, joined the draft. They had to answer a specific um, questionnaire to prove their loyalty and um, disavow themselves from the Japanese uh, Imperial Army and whatnot. Um, so these are people, these are Japanese American citizens who are actively going to join the United States military in World War II. And my thought with that is um, we have queer ancestors in every aspect of history. We have queer ancestors everywhere that we haven't seen, especially knowing how much, how difficult it was to find those stories immediately I know what I'm gonna do. Um, so I create this print and the context of the scene is all of that, all of that context of tension, proving Americanness hand in hand with proving masculinity, right? For an Asian male um, in, in the United States military, proving your belongingness, proving your humanity. It's a context of incredible tension and a performance and this print itself this is a moment in that context of tension and silence where these two Japanese men in the United States military well gay Japanese men in the United States military have this moment of passion of unmasking of literally you know tearing away the performance to reveal that which is natural which is beautiful, which is incredibly powerful. So it's a moment of weakness in that facade, yet at the same time, and very importantly, it's a moment of power that is depicted in this print. And I think for me, it's really important that um, this print is seen as a moment. Um, it's part of a, it, there's supposed to be more panels to it, the basic idea is there's, this is the middle panel, this is the height, this is the peak, and then um, the first panel and the last panel are both extremely emotionally muted. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is because this isn't just a kiss, right? It's everything that these people want to be but can't. Um, and it's, I think something that I was reaching back for, looking for one of those brief moments of truth mm -hmm. in a, tra a long tradition of silence. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that helps us kind of reflect and think about what that silence has robbed us, robbed from us. Um, and I guess implications of like, 
you know, in your own body, in your own life? What is it like to unmask and be vulnerable and in that vulnerability, find your power? Um, so that's a little bit of um, some of the thoughts that came up while I was carving away all of that white space. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for letting me talk about it. Let's go to the next person, Katie. Thank you, Dylan. That was just really an incredible sharing of history and then also the layers of emotion in that print. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. So now I'm really delighted to invite up Enzo and Enzo is going to talk about their print for the Brown Lover Boys. Thank you, Enzo. So glad you are here with us. I guess like just... Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Enzo. My pronouns are they, them. And I did a sort of a piece on Chavela Vargas, who is most commonly known as Frida Kahlo's um, lesbian lover, um, but is also known to be a very boisterous, uh, prominent singer during that time, um, and was also known for sort of defying traditional um, gender roles that were expected of women within Latinx communities. Um, which is why I also uh, wanted to do a tribute to the term marimacha with uh, the thorniness surrounding um, Chavela. <clears throat> and just pulling from my own um, artist statement, um, I decided to encompass both the term marimacha and Chavela um, because it is a very common term uh, you hear within Latinx communities, especially towards women who aren't sort of adhering to traditional femininity standards or roles. Um, and I think as someone who is now mask, um, right, a trans mask, um, Mari Macho is a term I heard a lot growing up and was used uh, very commonly to police my gender. Um, and I'm sure that other folks, right, other trans mask folks um, out there also have had similar stories and so I wanted to commemorate that experience um, in this print. And um, yeah, they, um, yeah, like it's it just, I just wanted to commemorate that experience. And also as I've leaned in further into my masculinity to also sort of reshift my relationship with it and to take ownership in it, to reclaim it, and that, you know, it was part of the piece that brought me here where I've now been able to settle comfortably into my masculinity. And this is the piece that arose out of that. Wow, thank you, Enzo. So, so powerful. And I love the way you interwove your own experience with that of, of an ancestor. So thank you so much. I loved seeing in the chat, someone said, whose lover do they say that, 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 um, that Chavella Vargas yeah. was? Oh, and I'm like, well, awesome. let's make a list. <laughs> yes, one of uh, Frida's many, many lovers, yes. Um, but specifically Chavela Vargas um, and Frida, there's a, a really popular picture of Frida and Chavela um, lying down, laughing. Um, and this is sort of an older portrait of Chavela because I also wanted to commemorate not just her um, specifically associated with Frida, but also like that queerness does, you know, have a life expectancy beyond the age of 30. I think that's also a really uh, common conception within our communities is that queerness, that transness, non-binariness like expires uh, once you are no longer in your 20s. And I wanted to also, you know, like commemorate like Chavela herself um, as an elder, as, you know, rightfully settled into her masculinity as I have also settled into mine. Beautiful. Thank you, Enzo. Thank you so much. Yeah, wow. Oh, wow. Okay, 
So now, wow, I'm just so wow. There's so much. Um, so now I would like to invite up S. Dunye, who's going to talk about their print, The Ones Who Love. Hi, S. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, this print came out of the, it was the first print I made um, in QAP. And it came out of this kind of search for African queerness and, and love in my own personal history. Um, so I'm half Italian, half Liberian. And my mom, who's also in the group chat, like being awesome, um, you know, was, was born in Liberia. Um, but, but that part of my history is something that's like kind of was always, even though obviously I have another side that's Italian and that kind of stuff, but it was hard. It felt it felt inaccessible, the, the African side in some ways. And so it's always been something that I've wanted to kind of dig into and research. And this piece kind of came out of this like block I was reaching in my research. And maybe that's just because I didn't have enough time and didn't research as much as I could have and didn't have, you know, the funds to buy all the books and things, but I just couldn't find pre-colonial and really colonial queer trans hist like Liberian history or Liberian stories or Liberian myths. It was just something that felt so like most, there was like hardly any pre-colonial Liberian history at all like from my internet searching and so it was this kind of weird moment where I was like oh okay well what do I do now and I turned to my family I turned to my mom um because you know she knows everything and has everything and is always gives me the best advice <laughs> um and and so she let me borrow this book that had a variety of African designs and and art and you know that's kind of a lot of what comes out of Africa is just the visual we don't really have as much like I don't know if you I feel like from from what I can tell like it's all the, the art and all the collectibles and all the the things like that and not as many of the stories but that's still you know still valuable and so I just decided to kind of go through that book and look at all the work and start to kind of piece together what felt connecting like what connected to me um because I couldn't you know I'm there's not there's not like a guide <laughs> so I just kind of felt chose what I wanted to do and kind of followed this feeling that I'd always been like really appreciative of is that feeling of queer love when you find someone who is like you I feel like that's really inherent to how I understand queerness is that loving another queer person is loving part of yourself and and loving the similar like you know you it's you can't not you know it just doesn't work if you're queer and you don't have you don't love something about yourself um and find that in other people and how you make your friends and how you how you live with other people so I found this image that was like these two interlocking figures and I kind of expanded it on that and it felt really good. It was like really kind of just like a wonderful experience, even though I was kind of frustrated at the beginning. Um, and like, I don't know, I, I think that's kind of like all I wanted was just to be able to feel, you know, satisfied out of my, out of my research and out of my emotions and, and reaching into myself and kind of finding that. Mm. So, and thank you to my mom also, because I have to say, this queer ancestor stuff has all been instilled in me. And appreciation for my history has been instilled in me from childhood. My mom is an amazing woman and has made amazing art and is powerful. And his queer ancestor is like how I view her. So <laughs> thank you, mama. I love you so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, S. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you for for taking us on, on your, your journey, on your reach. And um, 
and thank you for persisting on that journey as well. Um, beautiful, beautiful, thank you. So now I would like to invite up Kazi, Kazira Miranda Gonzalez, who's gonna talk about her incredible print, Geneset Gutierrez. Hey, Kazi. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is my name is Kazi. My birth name is Casaida, but I go by Kazi because my name is hard to say, but it's okay. Um, my pronouns are they, she. Um, I was part of a Queer Ancestors class last year, which was an honor. Um, it was great to work with the sorry to work with the press machine. It's definitely very different to work with a spoon, but you know it worked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here's my prayer for Jenny Seguitierrez. Um, so she's one of my um, heroes. She's, um, so I actually found her on Instagram um, for all the activism she does. So I'm going to read a little about her so you can get to know her as well. Jenny Seguitierrez, she, she is a transgender immigrant activist from Tuxapan, Jalisco, Mexico. She immigrated from the States when she was 15 with her family for better economic opportunities, seeking safety. She started high school here, learning English, um, learning English as well as the rights that immigrants don't have, um, which I relate to a lot. You know, I didn't know I was, un I'm an undocumented person and I didn't know I was undocumented until I was like 15 and it like turned my world upside down. Um, you know, I didn't go to college because of it, but college, that didn't stop me from learning um, the things that I know now, for sure, because I'm, I'm a very passionate person, <laughs> I like to say. Um, continuing with Jenny Seguitieres, Jenny Seguitieres now is based in Southern California. She's one of the founding members of La Familia, which is a trans queer liberation movement an organization committed to liberation of trans, queer, and gender non-conforming Latinx to build power and reimagine our communities free from oppression. She also seeks to abolish the systems that were built to marginalize, criminalize, imprison, and kill our people. Jenny said believes in the importance of uplifting, centering the voices of trans women of color and all racial justice work. <laughs> this is my favorite part. This is why you're my hero, Jenny said. I don't know if you're here, but this is why you're my hero. In June 2015, Jenny said received national attention after in interrupting President Obama during a speech at the White House, um, celebrating LGBTQ accomplishments from the previous year. So 2014, those, those accomplishments. She, she stood up at the dinner while he was giving a speech um, and she called him out for deporting more than 2 million documented un people, 2 million documented um, immigrants during his presidency. More, believe it or not, more than any president has ever deported since ICE was um, since ICE was implemented by Bush administration in 2003. So ICE hasn't been here that long. Think about that. They've only been here for about 17, 18 years now. So they weren't here before. They were only here after the 9-11 attacks. And ICE was created after, sorry. <laughs> ICE is a system created for racism that holds adults and children without their will at detention centers, where they wait for deport deportation for months or even years and are treated as the last priority to the government. Uh, Jenny Se embodies the spirit and power of trans women who fought for the liberation of LGBT communities such as Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson during the Stonewall virus. Jenny Se continues the fight for the liberation at the, uh, for the LGBT community. She speaks at rallies nationwide and protests the dishonest, corrupt, partisan government of the USA by fighting for justice for the trans people killed at the hands of ICE. Jenisa deserves to be honored every day as all trans people should. She is dedicated, so this is dedicated to you, Jenisa Gutierrez, uh, for being one of my heroes. Um, and I'll post my website in a minute if you, you know, if you're interested in the print and in my Instagram. Uh, thank you, and that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kazi, for bringing your eloquence and your power to that, to telling us about this, this print. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kazi. Ah, okay, now I'd like to invite up Mo. 
Maria Olivia Davalo Stanton, who's going to talk about their print, um, Visit Me Your Small Madness. Welcome, Mo. Yeah, my name is Maria Olivia Davalo Stanton, or Mo. Um, I'm going to talk about this print, Untitled Self Portraits, quasi title of Visit Me Your Small Madness. This is actually the fourth print that I did as part of the Queer Ancestors workshop. Um, and the first three are situated in like very specific time periods. I went to the past for my ancient Greece for my first one. The second is more the present. And the third, I went to the future in a sci-fi wor queer world. And with the fourth one, I started off, I wanted to go continuing this sense of exploring queer and transness through time and space. And what does it mean to step back from that and just be outside of the time continuum? Um, and the first thing I thought of in doing that was Lovecraftian horror or cosmic horror uh, and the idea of madness and going mad, um, which really in my mind connected to how queerness has been pathologized or transness has been medicalized and what it means to be considered mad or considered othered or marginalized in different ways. And also when I bring up Lovecraft, I wanna be very critical of him. He was very racist and his treatment of mental health in uh, horror is problematic and just weird at best. But the idea of being witness to or being part of something that is so altering and so undescribable that it changes part of who you are. I feel, I feel like that has a lot of parallels into a queer narrative or how we queer and trans people can inhabit space. Um, and so the idea of madness as something that is unimaginable, that is <laughs> othering, that is, uh, you lose part of yourself in this. And that madness is something to be feared or something that we're taught to be feared. Um, and then in like reflecting on all these different parts of this, I remembered uh, a quote from when I actually was researching for my first print for this pro uh, workshop, which is the, visit your small madness upon me, I pray that the great madness may pass me by. And that, I think, really spoke to a lot of things I was trying to figure out how I felt about mad the idea of this great madness, this thing that is destructive, that is overwhelming, that is all-consuming, and it's something that I fear, personally. Um, and connecting madness with mental health, with being othered. And I've struggled with mental health, and last year did not help with that aspect in my life. And everything just felt like it'll become worse, that there is no future that is not downwards, that is whatever this life is, is just, it keeps us spiraling away. And that is the great madness for me, this fear of destruction, this fear of losing myself in that. And here, this prayer really is about acknowledging that and finding ways to engage with that greater madness that is losing yourself, but in a cathartic way rather than destructive in this. And this print became my small badness in a sense that it allowed me to feel those things, to recognize them and to kind of relieve the pressure a little bit on the great madness that is ever present mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. The idea that a small madness can be art, I think was very cathartic in a sense and allowed me to build something and feel something that was not just destructive, great madness. Thank you, Keith. Wow, thank you, Mo. Thank you for that example of using our art, using our creative passion to, to move ourselves to wellness, to health and to hope, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So now I would like to invite up Manuja Ganesh, 
who is going to talk about their print these days. Welcome, Manija. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd just like to say that I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to be vulnerable in front of so many people who I know and who I don't know, especially people who are very close to me and family members and chosen family members who are here as well. And um, this piece came from a very personal place. It also came from a place of trauma. It came from a place of understanding and processing a lot of dysmorphia that I was experiencing. And the image of the mirror had been coming to me a lot. It'd been coming to me in dreams. It, it was just, I was noticing it a lot. And it's, it's something that's been constant, even in my, like in my bedroom, like I have so many mirrors everywhere and um, somewhere they scare me, but also in so many ways, they have helped me to face my own queerness, to come to terms with it. And I think I'd just, I'd like to read a piece that I wrote to accompany the sprint. Sometimes my ancestors come to me in dreams. They come to me in portals through unseen magic. Sometimes I see them in the mirror. Sometimes they appear through different people, separated by lands, by languages, by cultures, by histories. And hibiscuses are my favorite flowers, adorning her feet on the loud rickety one bee from Shantoshpur back to New Alipur. When the sun has set and the neon lights jar my vision, wilting simultaneously in service of her. And Patti's signature scent is fresh jasmine, lying in wait while the household sleeps in a plastic bag hanging on the doorknob, strings and strings, plucking petals one by one. Kannama, they are living too, they feel pain too. And tulsi juice mixed with honey and lemon is the perfect remedy for a sore throat. Force fed, kena baba, shab thik ho jabe. Did you know, did you remember? Did you erase, erase, erase so forcefully that there were holes? And I submerged myself in water, in ancient medicine, to try and feel something, anything at all. But how did you know about the floods in my tiny bathroom when the tub can't contain everything that pours out of me, drip by drip? Did you watch my trauma escape down the drain? Did you mop up the messes on the kitchen counter? Did you scrub the mold in the cracked tiles tirelessly, night after night, so as not to leave a trace? Do you remember the ratio of ginger to cardamom? How many times did you forget about me? Do you remember how classic miles taste in a foreign country, in the biting foreign air? How many times did you erase me? Do you remember the quiet sweet and the salty? I think that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you so much for sharing this space with me. Thank you, Manager. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing your, not only your visual creation, but your poetry with us. Okay, and now um, uh, I'm gonna invite up Raleigh Clark. Um, and Raleigh is gonna talk about her print, With Love, Flowers Will Grow. Welcome, Raleigh. Hi, everyone. My name is Raleigh, and this is my piece, With Love, Flowers Will Grow. And this piece is the first of a series that I hope to create centered around fairy tales and folk tales that prioritize black and queer experiences. Growing up, I never really considered myself to be a writer, but I loved to read and I loved to get lost in the fantastical and mystical worlds of dystopian and fantasy novels. And I often found myself really longing to be like the protagonists that I read about, but never finding myself represented and finding people that looked like me, sounded like me, or acted like me. Um, and I just realized how little diversity I had in the content that I consumed. And to have grown up reading about other Black queer women who were, uh, were allowed to exist as protagonists, to save the day, to fall in love, would have had such a drastic impact on my experiences with self-discovery as a young person. 
But being a part of this workshop has reminded me that so many others have shared my thoughts and have then created the narratives that they wish to see in the world. And so many of our queer ancestors have paved the way by creating stories and works of art based on their unique experiences. And through this project, I've been able to both pay homage to my queer ancestors and begin to find ways to insert myself into the timeline of queer ancestry. Um, this first print, With Love Flowers Will Grow, depicts the climax of the first story that's still currently in process and still is currently untitled. But in it, a young woman lives deep in the meadow, having isolated herself for years because of an affliction that she has lived with her whole life, which is that whenever she loves someone, be it platonic or romantic, flowers grow uncontrollably all over her body. She grows accustomed to a life in isolation, using her connection to plants and nature to grow everything that she needs to survive and is fine with her life until she meets a mysterious lady knight who teaches her how to love and accepts her for who she is. And she falls so deeply in love with the knight that she blooms more than she ever has before, which is depicted by the variety of flowers and plants in this carving. Um, and as an artist, I believe that Black queer women and people of all historically marginalized backgrounds deserve the right to exist in fairy tales, folk tales, and stories, no matter how cliche and cheesy they may be. I believe that centering our narratives normalizes the idea that we have always been here, which a lot of my um, co-artists have talked about tonight and really just positions us in the timeline in a way that we've always deserved to be. Um, I am excited to continue this series and to continue to find ways to center Black and queer narratives in any way that I can because through art we can create the worlds that we want to exist and provide for our younger selves the things that we never knew we needed and that's what I always return to as the root of my art practice. So thank you. Back to you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Raleigh. Wow. Just such a like absolute flowering, splendiferous flowering of creativity there. Thank you, Raleigh. Wow. Okay. Mm, I am dazzled. Um, so uh, there, I want to mention that there are many, many more pieces in the show. Um, and uh, so each artist has only spoken about one of the pieces and in a little bit we'll tell you how to see the rest of them. But um, now we're just going to ask uh, and ask the artists a question that they developed, um, which is how has the Queer Ancestors Project affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor? So I'd like to invite Bags to come on back and tell us how the Queer Ancestors Project has affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor. Welcome back. Um, yeah, uh, creating um, through the Queer Ancestors Project um, really just helped me, like was like a reminder um, of that, a reminder that, um, the, even though, like, it's hard to remember the past and that for multiple reasons, like whether, um, the histories have been erased um, or they've just been forgotten because time, like a lot of time has passed. Um, unearthing is something that is inevitable and even though like there, it, even though like I, like having, basically having um, to do um, work or to create through the Career Ancestors Project, like it, it was very emotional um, and having to realize like all of the ancestors that have come before me that I had never known and will ne probably never know is kind of a scary reminder that like there's 
like that is a possibility that can happen to today as well like um being forgotten is something that is just very real um but through the process of creation and creating something tangible that um like can it it's really leaving some kind of evidence that like we existed and even though i have a lot of like fear of being forgotten unearthing it, it's part of that cycle of remembering and i'm not the i'm not the first and i'm not the last and so regardless of what happens it's an, it just becoming an ancestor is inevitable and i it just helps to think that in the future there will be more people who are like me and who will carry on um the history of our people mm. um, sorry i yeah that's there's a lot of thoughts there but um yeah just art is just a way that helps us to know that we won't be forgotten Thank you, Bags. Thank you for taking us on that on that journey with you through through so many um, emotions. Yes. Okay, I'd like to invite up Cairo Mo. Cairo, you want to come on back and um, tell us how the Queer Ancestors Project has affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor? Yeah. So, sort of similar to what Bags was saying. Um, my process of researching um, was basically, I was trying to find all these lost gay stories in Chinese folklore, of which there are many, but I've been, you know, forgotten or erased due to imperialism, colonialism, all that. Um, and this process of, you know, finding these stories and also connecting them to my own life, like, researching my own lineage and you know what shamans even were like I didn't know that I didn't know an anything about Chinese folklore basically until I um like joined Queer Ancestors Project so like you know sort of seeing the ties or like smithing you know my story into the story like the mythology of Chinese folklore um, basically has given me a way to see myself and my art as like a crucial unremovable piece of um, just culture and community and history in general in my ancestors um, and has kind of helped me value my work a lot more um, it's like given me a sort of like a purpose, like an archival um, process of, of my work um, to, you know, fill in a gap and insert or illuminate the places where queer and trans people have been in my ancestry and my history. Um, so, yeah, kind of like what the guys is saying, like not being forgotten and this process of leaving things behind. Yeah, back to you, Katie. All right, thank you, Cairo. And you do so much um, work with, uh, with Chinese folklore and all of your prints. It's really remarkable. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and now I would love to invite back Cielo. Cielo Flores, would you like to come and tell us um, how the Queer Ancestors Project affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor? 
Yeah, I mean, overall, the process um, of creating was one that I wasn't really doing as much. And so to kind of jump back into it in a moment, like where we're in a panini, right? Like it was, it really put me to face like my actual desires of wanting to create more and like what is actually stopping me from creating. Um, and I think what really fueled a lot of my interest in, in like joining uh, Queer Ancestors Project was, was really that like, it's just time for me to like create the stories that I want to see, right? And also um, like feeling tired of like feeling disconnected and kind of lost with my own lineage. It's just like, it's time for me to just do the research and like connect with folks who are preserving and like be part of that movement to preserve what has been lost or what is um, in the works of, of being revived. So I, I really just wanted to join um, that kind of movement what I've been seeing from folks around me. Um, I'm really inspired by the community around me, um, for queer and trans folks around me, um, just really just doing the work. So um, yeah, that's where I find, that's where I find myself right now. And, you know, in some years, we'll see, you know, myself as an elder. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Cielo. All right, Dylan. Dylan, would you like to come on back? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, how the Queer Ancestors Project has affected how I think of myself, may or may not think of myself as a future ancestor. Um, this is a difficult question, uh, and I am going to lean on my prints to kind of frame my experience. Um, I only made two. <laughs> um, the one that I talked about, the kiss earlier on, um, I sat with it a lot, and as I was sitting with it over months, um, I saw very complex pain, um, come up out of it, and it's pain that, you know, it's pain that's shaped by world systems, those huge things like diaspora, war, um, really global, like, world-sized pain <laughs> um, that is held in human hearts and in homes. And this is what happens when you sit with history. Um, what's so wonderful about the Queer Ancestors Project is that these stories are about us. That's also something that is really scary about this project. Um, these are stories that are about us and our families. Um, so that's difficult. That's difficult to deal with. Um, but in, in being an artist and sitting with this and having such a long process of um, creating where you're also sitting with every emotion behind what you're making, um, it's important it's so important to see yourself, um, to see yourself fully. Um, and that means also, that means seeing your emotions, your history, your wounds, your needs and your triggers, all this, and then learning to speak on them, learning how to speak about them, how to acknowledge that. And so that, so that you can heal so that you can be present moving forward. I think thinking of myself as a future ancestor, ancestor or not is not a question that I'm gonna be able to answer, but what I do know is that I'm gonna be taking things about kind of like a, a practical emotional approach to how do I go about in the world as a queer person or just as a person. And learning from doing these prints is, this one in particular is about healing and sitting with very complex emotions and that's something that is you're not going to get very far it's something I've realized you're not going to get far if you are trying to do good in the world you want to be an, an ancestor to your peers um, you want to be an artist you want to be whatever you're not going to get far before you realize you have a lot of internal healing to do um, 
And as much as, as much as our lives and our internal emotional selves are very complex at heart, I am also a simple creature and I do simple things. And that is, brings me to my other print, which hopefully you'll get a chance to see. It's more of a, it's a personal reflection. It has to do with braiding hair and making connections. Um, it's a personal reflection, reflection on choosing to connect offering a space to be vulnerable and to receive gifts from each other. It's an act of making um, with the goals of relating and loving and just doing good um, with what you have, doing good with what you got, because that is all you can really do. And so, and that's how you affect the world around you. That's how you create the world that you live in and how you create your relationships. And so taking both of my prints together, what I've learned about how to go about in the world is to prioritize healing, prioritize connecting, and throughout that, just love yourself and love others. I feel like that's really, you know, like I'm not gonna know, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not even going to try to figure out if I'm going to think of myself as like a future ancestor or something. I just know that our art is representations of emotion and practice. And when we do those things in our real, in our lives and in the ways that we create things and, you know, if you're making art or helping a friend or whatever, like that's how you're making an impact. Um, yeah, so I'm really glad that I got to kind of reflect on that a little bit. And thanks so much, Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. That was very, very powerful. Very wise. And I'd like to invite up S. S to... Hello. Hey, welcome back, S. <laughs> um, so... For me, I think when I think about like now how I see myself as a future ancestor, I kind of want to think about how I define ancestor because I feel like I want to just think of them as people who have, you know, impacted or had connections to other people and have left that memory. But I almost feel like there's a, there's something more to it than just that. And I wonder if it's kind of more of like almost like a cosmic thing <laughs> of like, you know, you're kind of being an ancestor or becoming an ancestor means that you're kind of intentionally presenting a truth out into the universe or something or like you know, like, I feel like for us queer ancestors have, have all been people that were, like, really, and, and even the ones that don't, like, exist, we're all people or have, that have kind of done, you know, existed in a sense that, like, was true in t to their internal self and, and did that in a way that was, that was, you know, not just necessarily like, like, oh, I'm just out to my family or out to friends or out to whatever. It's more like I'm out to myself, I think, or like I am queer in my own in, and I'm projecting that in my, in my identity. I don't know. It's a bit of like a little jumble <laughs> in my head. Um, but, and I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I think I'm that kind of person. I definitely try to, to be true to myself and to my heart and to, you know introspective in my own self and also in my relationships with other people and that like hopefully that means that I can impact you know someone anyone I mean luckily I have a wonderful family that I've that are all super queer and all great so I've, I've, I know that I've impacted them but also like you know in a, in a general sense like the people that I come in contact with so yeah, I think for me, 
it it has evolved for sure within this within this course or in this workshop and i think it is that cosmic element or that you know element of internal truth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful thank you s thank you yeah. s. okay kazi would you like to come on back and tell us how the QAP has affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor. Hi. <laughs> um, well, QAP has definitely opened my eyes to so much. Um, I'm not originally from the Bay. Um, I immigrated here when I was four years old in 1999 with my parents, you know, for better economic and economic opportunities, because in New Mexico, there's no life. Um, where I'm from, it's just like a small village <laughs> where you could pay like $100 every two weeks, um, you know, to go get nuts and stuff. Um, but I thought a lot about this question about how I want to see be seen as a future ancestor. Um, you know, my work here is not done. I'm only in my mid twenties. Um, I've learned so much in the past two years from moving to Atlanta from here. I lived in Atlanta for 20 years as an undocumented immigrant. Um, I found out I was undocumented when I was in my teen years. So after that, my, you know, you know, my world turned upside down. And, you know, after that, I, I didn't have any hope, you know, for, for my future after high school. So I didn't go to college, um, but that didn't stop me, you know, that didn't stop me. <laughs> um, well, I moved here two years ago in January 19th, 2020, 2018, 2019, my, I apologize. Um, I love the Bay Area, you know, I, I honestly think I'm never gonna leave. Um, being here compared to Atlanta, it's like a whole different country. Um, literally just the people the vibes um it's just it's great I love it here <laughs> and I'm never gonna leave um you know I honestly think I'm 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 still working on making a name for myself you know I I loved art I loved art since I was in kindergarten um I had art class every year since I remember in kindergarten every year to senior year um um, and <laughs> I'm a Capricorn stellium, um, so that says a lot about me and my goals in life, um, in case you care about, uh, you know, astrology. Um, you know, I want to be remembered as a fearless person, um, honestly, who I don't care about other people's opinions. And that if I'm happy about myself, I love it. But, you know, I do take criticism. It's great. Um, I want to be remembered as a fearless person, passionate about you know everything I do. Um, I learned everything. I do oil painting, I do lino cut, I draw in pencil, I draw digitally, and I learned all that by myself. And you know, I'm really proud of myself. And my only passion is to help my family um, in the long run. Um, I experienced a lot of heartache and um, pain in the past year um, to my brother being deported. Um, he was here since he was two. He got deported last year and that was just something so hard um, to get through. I love being a queer person. Um, you know, I love everyone. <laughs> I think every person in the world has a great trait about them. Um, you know, I'm a Pisces. <laughs> in case y'all care, um, you know, I see the good in everybody. Um, you know, and I want everyone to always celebrate who they are. And, you know, and, and I want you to remember that your pain is always going to make you stronger so always learn from your mistakes and um you know um uh, things go on um I've been suffering from depression since I was 13 years old um but um thank god for medication because <laughs> that's the reason I'm still here honestly um but you know I want you to remember that any hurdle that comes through your life is a learning lesson um and just take that hurdle to better yourself and you know to better your relationships as well, which I have a hard time with. So I'm done now. <laughs> I can blabber on forever, honestly. Thank you for listening to me. I'll post my website and my Instagram uh, on the chat. Um, nice to meet everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Fearless Kazi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fearless Kazi. Oof. Okay, Mo, would you like to come 
and talk to us about seeing yourself as a future ancestor. Yeah, um, it's definitely a big question and one that I was trying to reflect on. I think a lot of us have said something along the lines of having to go back while doing this workshop, having to like go back and kind of make up the histories that we wanted to find. Um, and what does it mean for us looking back for ancestors that we didn't have everything we wanted to, like, to see. We know that the history is there. We know these people were there, but we couldn't find the pictures. We couldn't find the stories. We couldn't find the documents. And what does that mean for like in the future? That'll be me that people will be looking for, hopefully. Um, and there's, my first print was on Sappho, who is a, uh, a Greek poet, the fifth, sixth century BCE. Um, she's the reason we get the word sapphic and she was from the island of Lesbos, the reason we have the word lesbian. And one of her, we have very little left of her poetry. Uh, it's all fragments. Um, and one of the fragments says, someone will remember us, I say, even in another time. And I think that feels very much the idea of memory, the idea that beyond our lifetimes, we will still exist as queer ancestors, even if our physical form, our physical documentation is not necessarily there for people to find. And that I think, it feels nice to imagine that as the future for, for myself beyond when I'm here. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you, Mo. I imagine that with you, alongside you. Okay, and I would love to invite up Mainija. Mainija, welcome. I look forward to hearing how the QAP has affected how you think of yourself as a future ancestor. Yeah. Um, when I oh, when sorry. I think, <laughs> when I think about my work, I think about how so much of it exists within the archives and. There's like, just as a part of my practice, like so much of it has to do with digging, like just going through, like finding stories from, from my own family, from the places that I come from and from the people that have brought me here. And so much of that makes up everything that I try to put forth and um, everything I do in my practice, I try to do with intention and I try to do it with love and I try to do it with tenderness. And um, when I think about myself, like I really can't think about, I can't think about myself as separate from all of these people who have brought me here. Mm -hmm. um, my practice would be nothing without it. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist at all. And um, so much of that also had to do with like recovering and reclaiming stories that I didn't necessarily know everything about. Um, especially when I started making more work about my own queerness, that was something I would never address in my work. But I think this program really gave me the opportunity to like find a space where I could do that, be in community with other queer people and just have a safe space to, to share that work and to show it. And even now when I think like there was some, like there's someone that I still hold in my heart with a lot of love and we would tell each other, like, tell me a secret. And when I think about that, like so much of my work has to do with secrets. So much of it has to do with the parts that I choose to share and the parts that I don't choose to share and who I choose to share them with in specific circles, in specific communities. But I think at some point when all that work exists, when I've created it and when I've put it out, it will go back to the archives at some point. It, like whether it's born in the archives, whether it dies or whether it's reborn, it'll still be there. And it'll be there for whoever in the future decides to find it, so. I think that's, 
I think that's like the crux of how I see myself as an ancestor or as becoming, getting to that point where I can be an ancestor. Yeah, thank you. I think that's all I had to say. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Manija. Okay, and our last artist for now is Raleigh Clark. Raleigh, would you, I would love to have you come back and um, tell us how you think of yourself as a future ancestor. Yeah, um, where even to start? I, I feel like being in this program, I've learned so much in such a short amount of time. And I've been most struck just by the intergenerationality of community. Um, we have created this community for ourselves in this current time, but queer creative community which is so much further back and I feel like I've been re-envisioning the creative historical timeline as less of a line and more of a circle because mm -hmm. all of the work that exists before us has influenced me so much and our work will become a part of that circle that influences the work of the future generations of queer artists and so on and so forth. And I just find myself so inspired by that. And in a way it's like, you feel as though you're small, you know, you're just a part of the wider, longer story of artists, but no matter how small you are, your work will have an impact on someone somewhere. Um, I just remember, especially in college, like all of the times that I found this super tiny queer artist who like I'd never heard of and how their work just made such an impact on me and finding them felt like such a unearthing of a treasure. Um, and even if I only exist as an artist, as like a footnote on a Wikipedia page on, of queer ancestors, um, I feel like someone somewhere will click on that footnote and be inspired and um, by my work and by the work of everyone here. And I just feel so thankful and blessed to have worked alongside these artists for these 18 weeks and to have met Katie and to be here at the show talking with other queer people and supporters and family and to be able to share this work in this moment in time um, and share this joy and love of creating. Um, and I feel like that's something that just continues on and on in a cycle. And I'm really thankful that that exists. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Raleigh. That was pretty much like the fabulous conclusion that we needed to bring this program <laughs> to an end. Thank you for that. Um, so there were a number of things that I waited to say for when we had a technological glitch, but thank you to the wonderful Baruch and, and Esteban. We have had not a single uh, technological glitch, glitch. So I will just say them now. Um, our show is actually in three formats this year. This is incredibly exciting that we were able to install about half of the prints at Strut. They are there on the first floor. And because it is a center for health and wellness, um, folks are coming and going and experiencing the art and being hit. Um, so you can see about half of the work at Strut. Um, we also have a pretty incredible virtual reality show on Kunst Matrix. Um, so um, if you haven't been to a virtual reality show, now you can have your chance. And Ruth will soon be sharing that link. And it will also be on the website at the Queer Ancestors um, Project, uh, queerancestorsproject.com website. And then for those who prefer not to exist in virtual reality, um, all of the prints are also on the Queer Ancestors ancestorsproject.org uh, website. So you can scroll down um, and see that there's a link on the homepage to see um, the show in a more traditional website format. So there's three different ways to see the entire show, um, of which tonight we've only shared a small subset. Um, yes, so I want to also say that the next Queer Ancestors Project 
Prints workshop, which is entirely free and lasts for 18 weeks. And we hope we'll be in person. Um, we'll be starting in late summer. So watch for that. Um, and be sure not to miss it or the reading, the Queer Ancestors Project Rights reading that's happening in April. Um, by following us on Facebook or Instagram or subscribing to our monthly newsletter at QueerAncestorsProject.org. And let's see, if you got a ticket to the show, you'll be receiving an email from SurveyMonkey with a very brief survey. And filling that out really helps us and it helps strut tremendously. And most of all, we'd love to know what you thought of the show. We'd really like to hear um, your experience of the show. And also the demographics helps us and helps strut be responsible about who we're serving. So um, that would be wonderful. And so I think with that, it is time to say thank you again to all the artists. You have inspired me so much. You have moved me to laughter. You have moved me to tears. And I'm just so grateful to have had this chance to work with you. And I'm really looking forward to the day when we will physically get together and finally know for sure how tall we are relative to one another. <laughs> and um, we will print together in the print studio. <laughs> so now I'd like to, um, and thank you to the ancestors for giving us us. So I'll bring Baruch back to point us to the links to see the rest of the exhibition and um, wrap up the show. So thank you so much, Baruch. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I know myself and Esteban, while this whole uh, event was happening, just kept texting each other. I, 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 it's really hard not to cry. I'm trying so hard not to cry because... Um, I'm an artist myself. A lot of people that come to these events know I'm, I'm a writer and performer and stand-up comedian and visual artist. And this was such a wonderful night for me, especially during the pandemic. I feel a lot of us queer artists love community, love being around other artists, hearing words like the words y'all share tonight about your ancestors, about your identity, about your relationship to your creativity and your, and your identity it was just so moving. And it reminded me why we do work like this, why, we, why your art matters, why your queerness matters. And it's one of my, really one of my favorite parts of working with the Queer Ancestors Project. So thank you so much for sharing your art, being brave, and just also sharing your words and yourself. Like, Esteban and I literally were texting each other through the whole event going like, oh my god, that piece of art, amazing. Oh my god, what they said, so amazing. Just try not to cry. <laughs> you know? So thank you to everyone that came. Uh, and uh, I did add the uh, vir virtual art gallery link onto the chat. So if you missed anything tonight or if you're telling a friend about it and you want to share this awesome work and check out the rest of the Queer Ancestors uh, Project Art, go to that link and check it out. It's free, it's virtual, you can walk around it. Also, it's, it looks really, really cool. Um, as well as the survey that is gonna help Strut and Queer Ancestors Project, the link is also there. I'm gonna just share it one more time because, uh, you know, why not? If you have a moment, uh, it's just some easy questions. Go ahead, there it is in the chat, the link for our Survey Monkey survey so we can learn more about you. Real quick before we end, um, we have two incredible shows happening the rest of February. Trans Voices is one of the most awesome shows we do. It is uh, music, poetry, and comedy by trans artists. Uh, it is hosted and curated by Pearl Teese, and this month, Pearl Tease was like, it's February, I'm only booking Black queer artists. The show is going to be fantastic. It is February 26th at 7 p.m., free like all of our events. After that show, on Sunday, we're having Mental Health Comedy Hour. Two queer comedians who struggle with mental health talk to two other comedians about mental health, but then they interview a real life mental health professional to, you know, ask an expert because uh, laughter may be the best medicine, but also go to therapy, it works. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, cause both help, you know? <laughs> Um, all of that can be found on our website, sfaf.org, and our event page. But if you want to learn more about our events and what Strut does, uh, fill out the survey or just uh, shoot me an email, 
and I will put you on our mailing list. My email is right here, baruch at sfaf.org. And I will tell you about all our future events and hopefully a future literary event with Queer Ancestors Project. Um, we love working with them, so we hope you, they come back every year. Uh, we hope to see you at our next art opening next year when we do it. Uh, you know, hopefully not virtually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess that's it, unless I'm missing something. Oh, I really want to thank our interpreters. I want to thank Anna and Jennifer for being our interpreters tonight. We are pledging to try to make sure to provide the service to make our events as accessible as we can. So uh, if you come to the Trans Voices, we're going to have interpreters. If you come to Mental Health Comedy Hour, we're going to have interpreters. Um, and I mean, we're not going to be able to do it for every event, but we're going to try to do it for all of my events, especially my events, because I really care about making events like this accessible to all. All right. I just want to, everybody, please give a big round of applause to Katie Gilmartin. <laughs> Katie, you're just, just like... So fantastic. Esteban and I were just like, wow, Katie did all this with these incredible emerging artists. This is just, oh, it's fantastic. Uh, jealous of your job. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. I'm just going to let Katie say the final goodbye. Thank you for coming to the event. Okay. I'm going to pass it back to Katie and then I'm going to log everything off as soon as Katie's done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I noticed some questions in the chat. And um, one question that came a lot, up a lot is, can we buy any of this art? Normally we do have a show, uh, a sale at the show, um, but in this case we, are, we don't. But if you go to the QueerAncestorsProject.org website and email me, I will pass your request on to any, any of the artists. So absolutely, um, you can connect um, with the artists and wonderful um, that you're interested in buying their beautiful work. And um, I think there was another question that I wanted to answer, um, but mostly I'm just seeing all the fabulous quotes about what a wonderful, oh, and someone asked to see all of the artists again. And I think that we can't actually show all the artists at the same time because, <laughs> because Zoom won't, 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 won't let us show everyone. So, um, so I guess I'll just say thank you again so much to our audience and above all, thank you so much to the artists. Mwah. Mwah. Have a great night.